As we turn our attention now to the ancient word that is revealed to us through the writings of the Apostle Paul to the Christians at Rome. The fifth chapter, verses 1 through 8. Therefore, since we have been made righteous through his faithfulness, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have access by faith into this grace in which we stand through him, and we boast in the hope of God's glory. But not only that, we even take pride in our problems because we know that trouble hmm, produces endurance. And endurance produces character, and character produces hope. This hope doesn't put us to shame. Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us while we were still weak at the right moment. Christ died for ungodly people. It isn't often that someone will die for a righteous person, though maybe someone might dare to die for a good person. But God shows his love for us. Because while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today, my sermon is entitled, Peace, Grace, Hope. Trouble. Hmm. Peace, Grace. Hope. Trouble. I find it interesting that in reading this text and studying uh, it through uh, my various resources to prepare for this message this morning, that I came across a little tidbit that, that was of interest to me, especially in our time today. You know, the... The Apostle Paul calls on the church, the church, those who were believers in Rome, to seek peace, grace, and hope in a time when there was a brief period of unrest that had been visited upon the people who were faithfully following Jesus. Now, if you know about the church history, the great... Um, tribulation that came upon the early church didn't come until much later. There was a, pit, a place, a time of peace, and after Paul's, uh, who was Saul at the time, led that, that initial reaction to push against this rising radical cause of followers of Christ, that the church entered into a time of peace. But in this time of peace, there was a brief moment in that time period when there was some persecution. It wasn't heavy, but it was persecution. And Paul was writing letters of encouragement to the early believers to help them understand what it meant to be a follower of Jesus and not only the good times, but also times that were challenging. And it's interesting that... Um, that some 20 years had passed since Jesus' death, the resurrection and the ascension had occurred. Pentecost had occurred, and remember there were some people from Rome among those that heard the message. That a faithful church had come to exist in Rome, and this was the fascinating part, without any assistance from the apostles. They hadn't gone to Rome yet. So it had to have come out of those gathered there in Pentecost for, who were from Rome, who went back to Rome with the zeal and enthusiasm to start the church, to begin this early movement of the Christian faith. And so Paul 
writes to them. And I find it interesting as well that just in a quick study of Rome that it suggests that, that Paul had not met these followers of Christ prior to writing the letter. Yet it appears that he has this has developed a sense of kinship as brothers and sisters in Christ with them as he states early in the letter when he writes, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is re being reported all over the world. <laughs> now, that, that, that to me is, is a fascinating part of the letter. It's a fascinating part of the connection that reveals to us that Paul hadn't met them. He just heard about them, and he was excited about what they were doing. He was, he was pleased with their efforts to grow the faith. He was, he was enthralled with this idea that they were being difference makers in their corner of the world. And they didn't need the apostles. Whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute. <laughs> they didn't need the apostles. They became leaders themselves filled with the Holy Spirit, working out their salvation through believing in Jesus Christ. I, I, you know, I think about that and it's like, man, if they can be difference makers in Rome without the apostles' leadership, imagine what we can do with the wealth of information that we have in the Word of God that directs us to be difference makers in our time, in our corner of the world. Imagine what will happen when every church banners together under the banner of, of hope, the banner of peace, under the banner of which we call on the faith of hope. Peace, grace, and hope under that banner that we can overcome the trouble we face right now. Now, not just in the church, but in our world. I would be remiss not to say anything at all about the systemic racism that exists in our world. And you know, I shared with you last week why I'm so passionate and why my heart hurts over this. And you may not be a part of an assertive movement to be a person that shares your feelings of race. You may not be one. But to ignore or to even say we don't have a race problem is to be a part of the problem. We have a race problem. We need to own up to it. We need to confess it. As a nation, we need to confess it. And then we need to move forward as peacemakers to find a way to be able to see people as people. I've said this many times over. I really wish that we could develop the Spirit of Christ in us so much so that we could see others the way God sees others. God sees us all the same. There are no differences. We're his children. We're his creation. We are a part of those whom he loved. We're the crown jewel of that creation. I start acting like it. I start being it. You see, as we come to this portion of this letter, Paul declares, that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ and that we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and that we boast in the hope of God's glory. Wow, Paul. Now let's make this happen. Let's make this real. Let's make this very much a part of who we are as the church. I think the surprising part of his statement, his next statement really is this, that we even take pride in our problems because we know that trouble, here's that word trouble, produces endurance. Endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And this hope does not put us to shame. Do we read that right? 
Did I read that right? There's just no way that trouble can be good, can it? We've all faced trouble. We've all faced distress in our lives. We've all faced something that we look at and we just shake our head and say, wish we weren't going through that at this time. I wish we weren't going through what we're going through right now with all the violence, with all the hatred, with all of these feelings that cause us to take innocent lives and destroy property. It breaks my heart. Church, where are we in the midst of this? Are we the antagonizer or are we a part of the peaceful solution? Let's think about that. Let's think about that. Paul is talking about a deeper kind of trouble, though. The kind of trouble he's talking about is spiritual trouble. The deep-seated spiritual issues that need to be addressed. A trouble that comes when we're alienated from God and each other. In this kind of trouble, we come to understand that where peace, grace, and hope converge, there is always the presence of the human spirit, the mind, the will, the emotions. And that always has the potential to lead us down the path of trouble. Don't mess with my child. You have trouble. Don't treat someone I love disrespectfully. You'll have trouble. You said what? Trouble. What you do, what you say, I keep saying this over and over, what we do, what we say, what we think leads us down the path of trouble. You did what to that person? Really? Trouble's coming. Trouble has come. Now what are we going to do about the trouble? Oh, that we could master peace, grace, and hope in our daily living. When, when, I think then we would be, be certainly in the position to know that Jesus is over everything and that everything includes us. And He offers us the hope that we desperately need, even more so in this time. In this time of cultural trouble, we confess that is due in part to that reality that we are not seeing others as spiritual beings. We're seeing each other as human beings. When we don't see people as spiritual beings, we don't value them, nor do we give them any worth. Mm, folks, that's never good. When we see each other on a spiritual plane, we suddenly have the common ground upon which we can stand united as one voice and one heart of all God's people. This message may well be disquieting to you. It may be stirring up some thoughts in your minds. You may not be particularly fond of what I have to say, but this is what the Spirit's put on my heart. And so I say it. I don't say it out of hatred. I don't say it out of a disdain. I say it out of love. This systemic problem must be addressed. Do I approve of the violent destruction and loss of human life? Absolutely not. But whenever you have good that tries to come in and bring about a positive outcome, you know what's always present right behind good? the present force of evil that will try to take advantage of the good efforts of God's people. So we've got to stand guard. 
We got to, we've got to be ready to respond. And instead of standing back and complaining and even making charges against those who are trying to foster an atmosphere where we honestly and genuinely deal with the issue of racism in a real way, Instead of pointing a finger and saying, shame on them for doing that because they led to destruction, look at all of that. No, come on, folks. I don't approve of it. But understand, they weren't the destroyers. They were the messengers. There were others that were behind them who were taking advantage of their peaceful protest. Okay, gone to meddling. I'll stop. I feel that our trouble is that we're not seeing each other through God's eyes. And we are equipped to see one another through God's eyes. We're looking at each other and our differing viewpoints and ideologies as adversaries. There, I said it. We've allowed ourselves to become adversaries rather than partners with Christ Jesus to be change makers. We're looking at those with whom we differ with eyes that see them as flawed and unworthy. And those eyes are looking back at us. What we have is a vision problem. It's not, you know, I, I know the trite comment what we have here is, is a failure to communicate. No, no, we have a vision problem. And I know about vision problems. I know very much about vision problems. Those of us who are challenged with imperfect vision require assistance to see clearly. We can't do it without assistance. Many of us require corrective lenses so that we can see clearly. You see, some of us can see things that are close, but we can't see things at a distance. And there are others of us that can see things up close, but can't see anything at a distance. And, and let me say it again, and others can see at a distance, but can't see that which is close. When I said that first time, first thing twice, I was referring to those that also need bifocal and trifocal and multifocal and let's just get it in larger print so we can all see it together. Glasses and contacts can correct vision problems, but it takes a varying degree of correction to get it right. Varying degrees. If I were to remove my assisting lenses, I would be unable to see hardly anything up close and absolutely nothing far away. You, in these first pews, would be a blur. I could see my hand, but that would be about it. And if I wanted to see really something small, I'd have to really bring it up here, and I can't do that now because I'll give myself a headache. Um, am I blind? No. Do I see clearly? Yes. With the right prescription. The right combination, and that's even become trial and error for me in the last month as I've transitioned to a new way of seeing. Huh. But that's how we come to understand peace, grace, and hope in our time. You see, we see things differently, and there's nothing wrong with diversity of opinion, absolutely nothing wrong for folks to be left or right or somewhere in the middle. There's nothing wrong with that. That's just where we are. That's just how we think. It's how we're wired. It's what we've learned. It's what we've been taught. It's what we've seen modeled before us. My father, my father, no, I won't say that. He was, he was just diehard in his politics. 
He was a straight party ticket voter. Took him one second to vote when he went into the poll booth. Yep. One X and he was done. Just so you had whatever label it was, and I'm not going to say what it was, whatever label you had, <laughs> that's what he chose. Ah, oh, folks, our human frailties would have us quickly point out the things that make us different. But our human spirit would have us bring those thoughts and attitudes in line with the Holy Spirit. Well, I have a whole lot more to say, and I don't have time to get to it. Maybe I'll do a part two, but let me conclude with this. Our world is full of trouble. It is at best undependable and cruel. But we are loved, valued, and kept by God all the days of our lives. So may we stand in the gap during this chaotic time to consistently call for the standards of Christ to be upheld. His way is the way of peace, the way of grace, the way of hope that leads us away from the destructive paths of trouble and chaos. So let us meet in the gap and let's make a difference in this time of trouble. Amen. Amen.